Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix online meeting 236 at the end of May. Gosh, kids are almost out of school. Maybe yours are already out of school. I hope everyone's doing well. We are moving on to, uh, well, what we always been doing these lately, day, these days lately. Uh, that's triage. Uh, if you're here, go ahead and say hi. We had some technical difficulties getting the sound hooked up. So Ron and uh, Jacob have, uh, been helping us get those sorted out. And Ron's asked if we can discuss use of VMs. Sure, we can add that to the end. Start typing or getting your messages all ready to uh, uh, queue up into there. And after we get triage, we will cover that topic, Ron. Um, as always, these meetings are recorded for those of you that aren't with us right here, right now, uh, and are watching in the future, which is great to have you in the future with us. Uh, and we're actually gonna have some questions and comments because Ron's gonna start putting all that together. In the meantime, I think it's time for us to do triage. Right? Ready? Bob? It's triage o'clock. Triage o'clock. I almost like that. All right. Uh, one, two, three, four, four. I guess that's what that number says. So MSI version rule should be a compile, compile time. Uh, it's already known whether an attribute should be an MSI or a version or a Wix version, stricter Rules for MSI versions should be applied at compile time. That prevents bad experience. Wix actually spends time generating MSI at the end, especially when the version came from a Wix lib that was compiled separately from the current project. Okay. Uh, except then the problem is that our packages would be strict. The MSI versions are too strict for us to use as the generic package version. And if we put the compile time, that cuts off the ability to do all of the future package things that we could do now that we have these versions open. So I think this one, while true, we could check it. While true, building all this stuff and checking the binder does take more time. Uh, it is the place to check it because that's where the most strictness can kick in. And the backend, it, it, sh it, it doesn't take long to get from the, the compiler is practically instantaneous. I mean, every time we've measured it, it, it's like, it doesn't matter what happens in the compiler. It, it just takes zero time, essentially. Um, linking takes longer, but again, you know, the, we're not dealing with files until very late in the back end. So yeah, you know, sure. in, gen in general, I'm in favor of, of getting error messages as soon as possible, but uh, you know, in terms of clock time, checking them in the front of the back end, early in the back end, isn't, you know, isn't going to cause any, any yeah. real problems, yeah. any, any real delays. Yeah. All right. So can you explain that use case a little more where you're building an MSI, but you're not, not building, an, building MSI. an MSI? Yeah, we're not building an MSI. We'll be building something else. Like a NuGet package. With a... Like with a custom backend. Yeah. But with the MSI elements? With the package element, not the MSI elements, the package element. That's MSI. <laughs> not that's Today. Weird. Well, do get packages are called packages too, so package. Uh, that's going to get confusing. <laughs> yeah, we're... We'll get through it. It's a, it's a, it's an advanced scenario that we're going to that we've unlocked in V4 that will uh, come along later. And if we do this, then we we un we unlock no we relock it whatever we undo the unlocking, um, especially for something that is just a small time thing, time win. So I, I, we don't want to lock the Wix toolset to MSI in the compiler. It should be, we should lock to MSI. When you get to the back end, that's where all the MSI, deep MSI-isms will hit. And there's probably many more for us to work on and we'll do that. But the version will be kill us right at the top. All right, allow MSI version of 1.2.3.abc or 1.2.3. very large number. Um, I'm for this, I think. This, I, I thought you guys were against this so i'm against it <laughs> all right I, I i i kind of was like yeah this would be cool if we could allow it uh, it'll only work for uh minor upgrades if burn does it or if you do the math you're outside burn could and if you do allow same version major upgrades 
this would could work, although it's it wouldn't actually get the numbers valuing those sort of things. But I like the idea of it. I thought you guys were both against it, so I dropped it. I I'm think there's a separate opposed. I think like documenting and wanting people to use it as a semantic version is different than just letting people put what the Windows installer will allow. I I'm for this. I, I mean I'm I'm I am slightly for this. I, I it's as Bob has pointed out, it's pretty uh esoteric <laughs> and uh, hard to use well. One word for it. I, yeah, but um, I like the idea. I still like the idea of it. It, it. If it should not go without some diagnostic. Um, I'm. If you guys really want this, then it can be a warning. But I don't. I don't want to. So. Fine. If you if you guys want it to be possible, that's fine. But it should absolutely be a warning. You're out of spec. Oh, I th I think that's fair. With the Windows installer, we could warn on it. I, I I don't probably wouldn't have a problem with that. I think we already. Yeah, fine. We sh we could make sure that the warning for this worked correctly, uh, or said the right thing. Um, the change I think the the bigger change to allow this is to allow that dot separator at that third part there that's not currently allowed in the the processing of the Wix versions anywhere. Yeah, that's the part that I was firmly against. But that's the part that has to work too, otherwise Burn won't be able to understand these things. That's kind of true. Kind of <laughs> not. I mean, the point is, is that the fourth version, the fourth part of the version should be ignored anyway. So it's kind of weird that Burn is looking at the fourth part. But also, like, if both versions are the same, like if both versions have letters in the fourth part, then I'll just do a string comparison on that fourth part and everything will work okay. I I totally agree. The thing is that I'm pretty sure from the testing we did, it has to be a dot. Okay, but this was where I was not understanding your insistence on Simver. Like, I think it's much more correct to just add a dot zero and then a dash than to change the spec to allow a dot as a dash between the third and fourth part. Mm. This I, is I, where MSI I, versioning and yeah, Semver yeah. versioning are incompatible. Yeah, uh, so I, I, I'm... Right, it would... Uh, semantic versioning doesn't really matter in this case. Like, at, it doesn't play because we're talking about MSI version. And what I remember was that we it couldn't be strict semantic versioning because MSI wouldn't respect that dash. So it had to be a dot. The, the third part had to be a dot. So if we made that allowable in a Wix version, then we could represent these concepts, uh, this concept in MSI. If Wix so version I understand allowed, what you're saying there. Yeah. I understand it. But I don't understand why you want to change the spec when you can easily just add a dot zero and not have to change the spec. But that wouldn't get this scenario. Sure it would. Okay. How would you get 1.2.3.abc? That's not a valid Wix version, is it? It's not a valid Wix version, but Windows installer doesn't care. So why should Wix stop you from? So Wix version is the superset of versions that we support. So, like, 1.2.3.abc should absolutely be a warning. And I'm fine with 1.2.3.0-abc also being a warning. Okay, but that, uh, okay, but then we I, need... I thought to, MSI wouldn't support the dash. It yeah, it supports the dash if there's four parts. After, uh, it, after you get to the fourth part, it just kind of ignores everything after that. 
Including dashes. Including dashes and letters okay, okay. and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Okay. The the important part is the dot at the th the third dot. That's important. Right. So if we add that to the supported spec of things of versions that we support, then we can unlock these scenarios and they'll work correctly when there's an MSI. And if that MSI gets included in a bundle, it can work correctly and everything will just roll out from there. But if we don't support it in the Wix version, the dot in the Wix version, then things are going to get tripped up after that. The Wix version Why? is like the superset has to be the superset of the versions that we support. And then we can restrict it after that for installation technologies that don't support them. Okay, I don't want to support 1.2.3.abc. I only want to support 1.2.3.0-abc. Okay. So you could put that in MSI and they could author that. Today, 1.2.3.0-abc will not compile. Okay. Because it's not a valid Wix version. It is a valid Wix version. It's not a valid four part version. Sure. So so that's different. All right. So if we put a dot zero in here and a dash ABC, then we could say A B we could allow MSI to be created that way. But to do this, we have to ch update the Wix version spec. Th this as written right here, right? You would have to change the verification to not rely on the Wix version parsing. And then insert a dot zero for the user behind the scenes. They would author so, 1.2.3.abc and then behind the scenes, the version that ended up beside the MSI would actually be 1.2.3.0.abc. No, so for this, this issue, I was specifically asking for the Wix verification code in the Wix XE to ignore everything after the third dot. Okay. For MSI product version. Okay. For MSI product version. So if we do that, and then we put it in a bundle, what does the bundle get? Bundle will parse 1.2.3.abc as an invalid version, yes. major one, minor two, patch three. Yeah, but invalid. Data ABC. Yeah, but invalid. But then if they're, all their versions are like that, then all the, then it'll compare just normally. The only e e is either we should support this or not. Like, we shouldn't have it falling through to an error case and burn saying that uh, it turns out that you know, we can allow this in Sally's MSI, but it's not really valid from Burns' point of view, or Burns not going to see it as a valid version, and logic is then going to hopefully sort out. I, I, either we accept this format or we don't. Right now, we don't. You have to do, like you said, at least 1.2.3.0 uh, dash ABC. You can't have a, you can't start with a dot for the third part, for the metadata part or whatever, labels and such. So you're, this is not what I'm asking for. So there's kind of two separate issues we could have here. There's the issue that I created where we ignore everything after the third dot, which it sounds like we're declining. The second issue is allow a valid, any valid Wix version as an MSI product version. Sure. That and the second one doesn't satisfy this issue. Right, because both neither of these are a valid Wix version. Correct. The way to do the way I see to do this is to allow this to be a valid Wix version, and then we can make it work all the way through the whole system, and it'll just work. I mean, I guess that's fine. It's kind of weird that people can use other tools to build something like that, but. Other if Wix tools wants to be to, more strict than other tools to build something like that. You mean oh. they can use other tools to build invalid product versions? 
I mean, the documentation says a product version has three parts and everything in the fourth part is ignored. So, um, right. But this is why I was, I, I brought up the idea that allowing dot and everything else after it should be a valid Wix version because it would represent the MSI semantics. And you guys are like, ah, that's too esoteric. We shouldn't do it. I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. It's esoteric and it's not important for the product version. So I, I let it go. I was like, yeah, okay. This is saying we should bring it back. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I'm kind of in favor of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm still surprised that you're just. I don't want us to put a version inside an MSI that Burns not going to buy, that we no, know just, out of the gates I, not going to understand. I don't understand how you're not keeping my distinction separate. Like. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking. I don't know your distinctions. So I'm, I'm flummoxed at both so one, of you right now. So <laughs> one way to verify the MSI product version would be look for three dots and then just completely ignore what's after the third dot. That's correct. We could do that. Which it sounds like we're not doing. No, so because, the because, do it, because, the, because burn is an important part of our chain and we supporting that and not having burn support it is not a great Wix tool set story. So the other thing is just allow any valid Wix version. Correct. Now, that I, includes semantic versioning that MSI will not accept. Right. Now, 1.2.3.abc has never been supported by Wix as a valid MSI product version. That's true. As, as it ought to be. <laughs> so I, I don't understand why we want to change the spec to start allowing that as a valid Wix version. That's what this issue says. No, this is, issue is nothing about a, a Wix version. So the part that I, I have added through this is that if an MSI has this version and we build these things, we build these MSIs, we should support them and burn because it's the whole Wix tool set. MSIs flow into bundles. Bundles, if they're gonna, if we're gonna support these versions in Wix, bundles should support those versions of Wix. I think that's the part that I've I've probably added on top. It's like just saying, hey, you can build an MSI with this version, but Burn's not gonna support it. I don't think we should do that. It's not out of the Wix tool set. Okay, so let's close this one, and then we can talk about. I can create a new one about allowing any valid Wix version in. MSI product version. Correct. More than a four part, more than the restriction that the product version has on it today. Right. We could talk about that. And then there, I would not want to allow 1.2.3.abc as a valid Wix version. Sure. It could open the issue that way. Yeah. Okay. All right. I thought you guys actually agreed that we should try that and it would be interesting. But all right. Uh, Why the hell did you think I would want this? Not, not you. Sean opened oh. it. So I was like, wait, did he, he maybe he hit something and, or saw something that says, yeah, oh, yeah, you know, that whole thing that we talked to on that stream that one day, hey, we could, should do that. And I was like, yeah, sure, we could do that. I, I'm, I'm not, I, I am, I, I'm plus 0 0.05 and Bob's like negative 100 or something like that. So <laughs> somewhere. That. Yeah. So, and then I thought Sean came over and said, yeah, let's do a plus something. I was like, well then anyway, but it's not, it, it's, that's fine. All right. Um, so today the embedded error, the embedded messages from burn do some amount of stuff and we've not invested deeply in burn. And I think Bob has said he wants more. Oh, we're going on. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, send embedded progress is, well, send embedded error and send embedded progress are both uh, uh, sending less data than they could. Um, at the very least, they could include the package. Um, Right now, you get progress messages, and they're you know oh, they're you know five percent, ten percent. Well, sorry, they're actually they come in two. Um, one is overall progress, which is fifty percent, and then there's per item progress, 
Um, and the per item progress includes both acquisition and execution. And if there's no additional context in send embedded progress for the, the bundle runner to determine what these numbers mean. Um, and and there's no there's no contract um, that I'm aware of that you could even deduce like oh right we had six packages and um, therefore when it resets it's the next package well no you can't count on that because it turns out there's no progress whatsoever sent for sent a better progress anyway um, if there's no acquisition for the package or no operation. It's just skipped. So there's there's just no way to to do any math that gives you an interesting progress bar. Overall progress is fairly useful, except of course if there's no acquisition, it's immediately fifty percent, um, which it turns out is not accurate, but it's what we got. Um, and all the like in yeah, you know, in Wix three we had the what was it phase count as a new interface method, and none of that is exposed via send embedded progress. Send embedded error at least gives you all the error information, but again, it doesn't tell you what package it's on. So, um, yeah, not not great. Um, so, for what it's worth, I I don't I didn't explicitly add embedded progress but in v4 there is extra progress during acquisition so okay there might be more messages in v4 which, which which isn't great because you know it's different behavior um and again well it's already we like i said we can't deduce anything from from the progress um at best you have you know whatever the the overall progress is and that's that's fine um, it's just not great. And the other thing is, this is going to break the protocol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So is this yeah, so worth I'm, doing that? <laughs> definitely not in V4. Definitely not in V4 because, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, at the moment, I don't know. I don't know how a bundle runner could differentiate between a pro could differentiate between protocol changes. Yeah, it can. It well, I mean, I think the best case scenario is that it has to look at the bundle and look at the PE headers and find out from that, which is doable. This was a problem that I was running into with harvesting bundles. Package oh, for sure. bundle packages. Yep. Yep. So yeah, true. there's no definitive way to do it. If the engine version had been somewhere in the, you know, in the burn uh, PE header or in the manifest, then it could have been possible. But unfortunately, it's only embedded in the code. Right. Right. Yep. Well, maybe we should add the version in four. So the absence of it is three, the, ver the presence of it is in, is in four, and then we can start moving forward. I mean, maybe we can save ourselves by not having, or I guess it, whenever we need it. So I, I added the engine version into the manifest already. I was waiting for us to break the protocol before we, uh, and then the protocol itself can be enhanced to tell it to tell whoever's running it which version it is. And also the burn header probably should include the protocol version. But all of that yeah. stuff is breaking, makes it to where the old stuff is not going to interoperate with the new stuff. Right. But, but we do I, have to make that breaking change eventually. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you that the the protocol should be doing it, but right now that would be a breaking change. Um, I don't think it'd be breaking if we added the engine version or protocol version into the header. We have plenty of bytes to spare in that page. No, we don't. 
We don't? No, because there was a count of an attached containers. Mm -hmm. And that basically meant that every single byte at the end was telling you how about more and more attached containers. Mm, oh, 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 offsets to the attached containers. Right, yeah. So there was like a count of attached containers, and then at the end, there was basically an array of offsets. Right. right. Well, uh, let's see, a page is 512 bytes. We could not let you have 128 attached containers and have four bytes at the end for attributes. I don't know. Mm, okay. I mean, I'm for doing this. I'm just pointing out that that means V4 bundles won't be able to get progress from V3 bundles. Right, right. No, no. Well, and 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 again, you know, the, the embedded stuff is also for um, external bundle runners. That's the scenario I was working with, and. Again, right now, they support V3 bundles. They, they'll support V4 bundles with no change because the protocol didn't change. Um, when the protocol changes, we need a way for a bundle runner to identify the version, or we need the protocol to be backward compatible. I'm not a huge fan of that, but... I don't think the current protocol can be changed in a backward compatible way. I'm I'm I I accept that as a possibility, yes. Yeah, it, it, a lot of it has to turn into, hey, there's the presence of this thing. So if you get a message before the first progress message, it's like, hey, here's our version. And you're like, oh I didn't and then hey, here's our progress message. Then the cases where you don't get a here's your version before you get a progress message, you're like, oh, that's burn v3. <laughs> that's the way out of these, I usually. Yeah, I think the the sample bundle runner will ignore messages it doesn't understand. Okay. So that's probably reasonable to add a message that communicates the protocol version. And if someone, you know, responds to a message they don't understand with an error, well, then that was not a great choice. Yeah, well. Probably I, the best we're going to do. Yeah, I definitely need to sit down and think about this. You said not V4. Yeah. No, do we no, need no. to up the priority of it to make it better? I mean, if V4 is the same as V, or backwards power with V3, then we're just moving this issue down one more Right, version right. until we actually try to tackle these things. So it's not like we're making it worse. They'll just be V3 and V4, which respond the same, right. are all the same. Yeah. No, no, I, I don't, I don't want to add the fun, the, you know, like package ID. I don't want to add the functionality in V4. Um, I was hoping that we had a, a quick and easy way to identify a bundle as being a V4 bundle. Mm. Um, but it sounds like that's not feasible either. So then, therefore, the protocol has to change, hopefully in a way that, you know, a bundle runner can adapt to, um, even if it just means that, you know, a, v, a Wix v5 bundle will still work from a bundle runner. It just won't have progress. Worst case, it doesn't have progress. Better case would be it has the progress it has today and misses out on any improvements that we make. All right. Anyway. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm fine if this stays the same in V4 and we look at the protocol in V5. Be nice. I think there's some wiggle room. Yeah. Okay. John, disagree? Agree? Yeah, I don't think I 
be spending time on it. So. Yeah, I think it's. Yeah, no, it's, it's, well, it's late. I didn't want to put yep. It before. It's yep. Just, it, it it would be an excellent to have. Um, yeah. Maybe this is the uh, you know, this is the first time I was doing a bundle runner, so I'm like, oh well, okay. Do more in V5. Yep. All right. Uh, I'm still going this way. Uh, Wix toolset. Visual Studio not getting installed with Visual Studio Community Edition. All right, so this is ongoing, uh, maybe. Um, someone found that the, quick thing, the Wix toolset signature uh, signing certificate was updated middle of April, something like that. Um, with not a lot of work, that all kind of just worked out. So that was nice. But that does mean that Things that were signed with the previous uh, certificate of you know a month and a half ago, a month ago, whatever, uh, a month and a half ago, uh, are now have an invalid certificate or signed with an invalid certificate, out of, an expired certificate. But they were signed within the timestamp that says, "Hey, I was signed this time, so they should be valid." Um, and if you look at all our binaries, they look all fine; they're still reporting correctly. Certificate expired, but signed with a the time, therefore it's fine. V6, of course, has their own way of doing everything around all the signing stuff. And I was able to go back and get the previous, the now expired certificate for the votive and install it. And it worked for me. But we're seeing uh, this person has reported that it didn't work for them. And in there, they had a message that the extension is signed with an invalid timestamp. And I noticed that in their log file, their date format in the log file is different from my date format <laughs> in my log file. So uh, in the end, there's something about installing V6s uh, with expired certificates, but time stamped properly, that seems to be not working in at least one case. And then someone else popped up and said, they're seeing the exact same thing, but then what they're describing doesn't sound exactly like the same thing. Uh, so I don't know. Also uh, asked this guy to try the new uh, votive, which has not been published yet, uh, but is available on the GitHub to see if that worked for them, which of course it was, I think, signed with the new certificate. I don't know I think about it, maybe it was. I'm pretty sure it was signed with the new certificate. Um, I'm pretty sure it was. <laughs> uh, I hope it was because I just said, asked him to go try it with the new certificate that, and hopefully that works. And if it does, then we kick this over to the Visual Studio guys going, all right, here, we've tried to capture this logic as much as we could. Uh, there's something wrong with your V6 installer when the certificate is expired, but the timestamp is correct for some people. Good luck. Um, and I was just, so hopefully from all this, it goes away. I, I say all this because I'd like to keep this issue around for another round, uh, keep this issue open for another round and then revisit it again in two weeks. See if we got some progress on it. Cool? Cool. Bye for me. Things I do while futzing with the Wix 3 build process and trying to get it to work properly with all the updates from the, oh gosh, just, Anyway, that's done too, by the way. Um, all right, one, two, three, four. I think that's four. So, Ron, I hope you're ready. We're coming back to discussions and questions and comments and things that people want to talk about. Normally at this space, I'm trying to fill time to make sure that if there are any questions, people have a chance to type them. Hopefully Ron has pre-typed it and he's pasting it into the chat, um, although there's been mentioned that the chat is uh, has a limit of, what was it, 200, or 200 yeah, kilobytes? 200 characters. Oh, just 200 characters. Okay, 200 characters. Uh, so you have to cut and paste 200 um, characters. I haven't tried installing the V4 or V6. There's no V4 or V6. This is votive. This is votive V6s. Uh, so anyway, Ron, if you want to talk VMs, I don't, I'm, Curious what you want to talk about VMs? Uh, do you it was Sean? about the end-to-end -end testing? Oh, end-to-end -end testing and how to get end-to-end -end testing. All right, great. He's starting to send his messages along. Um, I guess we'll wait a second there. Let's see. Uh, otherwise, while he's getting all that prepped, I guess we can do the uh, the usual looking forward. Uh, two weeks is June 9th. I think that works out. Should be fine. Right, we can start getting into 
uh, off holidays and things like that. So, uh, but June 9th, I think is normal. So we'll be back in two weeks uh, at the same time doing the same thing, doing triage. Um, we're not ending the meeting right now. I'm just getting everybody prepped to think about two weeks from now um, while Ron fills in his multiple messages to follow. Um, yeah, so two weeks, all that good stuff. Anything else we should go ahead? Please discuss the general setup for using VMs when testing Wix. There is no general setup for using VMs when testing Wix. Uh, you create your own VM? Yeah. I mean, there's a readme in the test folder that explains what to do. Yeah, but I've always just been happy to rely on the uh, um, on the CI build. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not thrilled that we have to rely on the CI builds because it takes a whole lot of up and down and back, you know, and you have to wait the whole build. Um, True, but there, there's not a lot in the take this test directory, all these things, lift them up, throw them into your um, uh, what do you call it uh, VM, and then run them. Is the installation of the VM outside the scope of source code installation build procedure? Uh, yes, I mean it is today. There's no. There's no installation of a VM today. I mean, it should just be pick the OS you want to test against, and then run. There, there are there are two. Oh, so I'll I'll say how I use them. One, I rely on the CI build, right? So the CI build is just running um, as part of the big build on you know the VMs provided by GitHub and AppBear. Um, that's all automatic. You have your your test code. Uh, that that run you know that installs the VM or sorry installs packages and tests certain conditions, um, and those packages it's a little confusing, uh, but mostly good. The build like on your own dev box builds those packages but doesn't run the tests, which is good because where do you want to yeah you, know, you don't want to run potentially bad packages and mess up your shiny new dev box. And we want to catch if any changes in the tools broke the test, the build of the test at least, because we can do that. Mm -hmm. Correct. And that goes to my next step. Thank you, Rob. Good segue for, you can build these um, packages and bundles as part of the normal build and then go test them yourself on a VM manually. That's really only good if you have a test that is better run manually. Um, what we're missing at the moment is there's no easy way to take the tests from your dev box and run the tests and the packages on a local VM. That would be a nice thing. Automatically. Um, yeah, it's some somehow automatically. Yeah, a zip and, file and a batch file, right? With everything in it, and then you run, you pick them up and drop them on the batch file. So, well, yeah, I picked them up. I picked, picked them up in the VM. Why can I not say VM today? It's so weird. I keep saying all the other words around them. You something. It would be nice if our build just said, "Here's everything you need. You pick this up and you put it on a VM, and then you double click this, and it runs all the tests." We have definitely have not reached that level of. Uh, automation of that process today. But all so, the tests are the tests are written in C sharp with XUnit, right? Correct. So we'd have to we'd have to be able to bootstrap, you know, .NET Core, .NET whatever version we're using, and XUnit and whatever else, whatever other dependencies are required, and then you know ship all of the um, uh, the tests and the the packages and bundles and whatnot to test collateral over to the VM. Yeah, uh, we probably would have to have .NET and XUnit on the VM. Yeah. All yeah, right, so would. let's kind of go through and see if we've answered some All you of need is the SDK, by the way. Yeah, sorry, the .NET SDK. XUnit's in the SDK? I, you, do, you do a restore then to bring the rest of it down, sure. No, well, I mean, you're using .NET test as the test runner. But doesn't... So is XUnit included in it? 
No, I mean, X unit is one of the DLLs that's there. It is included in the SDK? It's included oh. in your build output. No, yeah, it's oh, 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 it's in our build yeah. output. Right, of course. Yeah. Duh. Right. I was like, wait, X units in the SDK? That's cool. <laughs> uh, no. All right. That makes much more sense. It's in our build output because we depend on it. All right. So let's go back to uh, um, questions. Let's see if we answered them. Uh, general setup for VMs when testing Wix. We don't have a general purpose, general thing. What Bob described is would be a great, would be a cool thing to go and sort all those bits and pieces out. Which VM products are used? No VM products are used. And I don't think we sh I don't think we have to care which VM products are used. It should be, you can nope. use VirtualBox, Hypervisor, VMware, whatever. It doesn't matter. Just get a Windows machine running. That's what you'd have to do. And probably, as we just said, Put .NET SDK on it, we'll probably will need that as well. Is the installation of the VM outside the scope of the source code installation build procedure? I think so. Um, I also don't think our, our requirements on a VM are very high that it, we need a whole lot there. It really is just a VM with Windows and then the .NET SDK. So there's that. Which is why the CI build is guaranteed to have those things. And oh, right. Right. And, but again, the difference is a local build, you don't want to mess up your machine. For the CI builds, we don't care. They're right. using VMs and they'll go away after the build right. is done. So are the VM hosted tests sequenced, individually started, manually run under VS? So the way the VM, there is no VM hosted tests. We have the CIC, uh, the CI system GitHub that we're using. That is every GitHub action or um, build starts up a VM, throws all your stuff in it and then runs it and they shut it down. That's the infrastructure that GitHub provides you. It's fantastic. It's great. What we do is I, I think, is it setting an environment variable? I forget. Is it just a command line switch, Sean? I don't. Yeah. Environment it, variable. It, you set an environment variable and as part of the build, it runs through everything. And if this environment variable is set, it will then also run the test, the, the, you know, what we call integration tests at the end of the build. And you could set that environment variable on your dev machine and the Wix tool set will then run all of our tests on your dev machine. And you will end up with hopefully a clean machine at the end. They try to clean up, but if not, you could end up with a real mess of stuff installed on your machine. When we run it in the CI system, it's not a problem because GitHub's like, hey, you're done, great. Throws that VM away and gets a new one or however they do that. So. So there are no VM hosted tests. We just run the tests as part of the build when this environment variable is set. If the tests are built by the standard build procedure, yes. So the tests are built by the tests lay, uh, layer and all of the stuff in there builds all of the integration tests. Of course, we build unit tests in all the individual layers and run those. Those are designed not to be impactful on your machine where the test folder is much more integrated and may have, and in the case of burn test, does have significant impact on your machine. Where are they stored? The tests get built to the test folder in the build output, and that's where they, and they get built every time you do a build, you'll get them. Um, how are they advertised? I don't know, they're not advertised. It's just a folder of files that then .NET test using the X unit runner runs them, so you just, .NET test it. And if you look in the test layer, you'll see batch files that in the end call .NET commands, MS build and then .NET commands to run the tests. How is elevation achieved? Well, so that's an interesting question. So elevation is turned off on the CI machine. So GitHub, when they give you the machine, they've turned off elevation. So there are never elevation problems. You're an admin, you can do whatever you want to the machine, you can do anything to the machine, you can do everything to the machine, and there will not be a single elevation prompt. And we take advantage of that so that it just runs. And if you had a test VM, you probably would wanna do the same because you will get lots of elevation prompts if you don't run the tests elevated. So They will refuse to run if, you, if they're not elevated. All right, even better. So you end up with, it will not happen. So how's elevation achieved? As you'd expect, it's required, you have to disable it or run it elevated. Can you run from elevated prompt to have everything work out? I haven't tried directly. How are the installations MSIs integrated into the tests themselves? The MSIs that are integrated in the tests are built as part of the test. So that's the nice thing about these tests. Like when I'm working on the core uh, Wix toolset, I appreciate these integration tests because they 
build things and add more that in the Wix side that build things. So they end to end use the entire experience to build the MSIs, the bundles, everything that's needed to uh, then install and do work. Uh, they can include the extensions, which include custom actions, which end up signing the MSIs and do work. So all of that uh, happens. Um, he, my immediate concern is written in C++ and X unit. Uh, I don't think any of the integration tests are written in C++, right, Sean? I can't think of any that are, they're all managed. No, the only C++ tests we have are the dutal and the burn yeah, unit so tests. For, for the unit tests that want to link against the libs and test them directly. But those are unit tests. Those are intended to not modify the machine, not need elevation, run quickly, ideally, and um, do small things, targeted things with the individual libraries. Unit tests. The definition of unit tests. Um, so for the for the installation of MSIs integrated in the tests, the tests are running MSI exec mm -hmm. whenever they want to install or uninstall an MSI. Yeah. Or bundles, which then installs them. Or install a bundle, uninstall an MSI manually, install another bundle. I mean, they do all kinds of patches. I mean, yeah, it's, there's I mean, a lot. He, he's focusing those. on the util user code, right? That's what he's trying to write. The util user code. Like creating a user, setting the description. Or ah, so there. A util extension. Gotcha. So there, there you'd want to go write a test. Got it. So there you'd want, if you want to test that the user actually gets installed, yeah, you'd go into the integration test somewhere, have an MSI. There is, like Sean mentioned, there is infrastructure in place that will help you install MSIs. Um, things like that, so you can, but it's all in managed code, um, and you uh, just, sorry, you write the user code in the extension. When you get to the test layer, it can use that extension and the rest of the MSI to build an MSI that installs a user of your choice, you know, your test user. So you, that MSI can get built, it can get installed, then you can have the code query the uh the machine to see that the user is in the state that you expect them to be. You could then uninstall the MSI and see that the user is in the state. You can do upgrades. I mean, you can do whatever as complicated as you want with the number of MSIs. All of that could be run as part of the, uh, in the test layer and um, so on and so forth. Now, um, I did recently need to test, uh, what, it was when we were updating the versions in the dependency code, which was a change to a custom actions which have deep interaction with the uh, burn. And so I use the integration tests to uh, validate that. And when one of them failed, I, I chose to uh, build the test, investigate or look at what it did. And then I actually <laughs> kind of YOLO'd it and ran that bundle on my machine directly with elevation prompts and things like that. So I, I essentially ran by hand what the test would have done automatically, I ran by hand to validate and work through the issues and debug it, um, things like that, on my machine. I could have spun up a VM and done it in there. Um, I actually tried to use Windows Sandbox, but that didn't work out. Um, so I just decided, you know, for this one test, for this one bundle with this set of MSIs, I trust that I can uninstall these MSIs, so I ran it on my local machine. But that was just for my one little part. Once I got it working, checked it in, and then let it run as part of the automated system again, and it all worked out. So that for that case with one issue and all the suite of issues, I was able to, um, I chose to run it locally on my machine, um, which is yeah, another choice. But if you want to run them all, you, you'd want to put them in a VM. I guess can well, I'd say for the util extension user tests, I probably would not want to run those on my a machine I care about just because you are messing with, you know, <laughs> You're messing with more important bit. It's like, you know, I run bundles, even elevated one per machine bundles all the time because I know that the MSIs are, you know, install a text file. I'm not worried about that. Yeah. That's a judgment call, right? You can run all of them on your local machine. We, we do not recommend doing that. But set the environment variable and you'll get them. <laughs> and yep. I don't know what you'll end up with at the end. Sean, you ported the 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 
util extension user tests, right? That's what you're. Yeah. You're, can you can you open that uh, in GitHub and stream it? Which one? Uh, like Wix for source test MSI. Yeah. I mean, oh. I meant just like browse the code on GitHub. Sorry, which one did you want? You said Wix for source test MSI. Yep. Let's see, getting there. And then there's only user tests here. <laughs> this change. Uh, so you, what do you want to look at? I mean, I guess this is where you would start. And then there's a readme that says how to run them. There's, and then oh, this, that, this MSI folder is newish. Yeah, right. Right, because I created the Wix one, not the MSI one. Right. Yep, 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 yep. So MSI and then walk through all of this. Yeah, in that, in that, yeah. See, uh, there it is. Build what needs to be built. Test the thing that just got built. That's kind of the pattern. So the build will happen on your machine. The test will probably be skipped. Yeah, this. See, if runtime tests are not enabled, then you skip the test part. So it builds, validates that the all the build stuff works, but it does not attempt to modify your machine, which will use this here. Uh, I don't. I haven't looked at this enough. Product A, product. Yep, yeah, that creates a group or finds a group and adds a user to it. To that group. Yep. Uh, take a look at the test code, though. That's. It's, oh yeah, you're right. You're right, right. Actually, right. kind of cool that there's already, um, already code in there to. <laughs> Did I just click the same thing? Util user test oh, product A. What am I? Oh, thank you. I didn't go high nope, enough. There nope. we go. Yeah, I got it this time. Up, up one. There we go. Oh, sorry. Uh, you're, I'm delayed. Yeah, you're delayed. It's okay. Uh, uh, which one? Is this the one? Probably. Yep. Yeah, there's product A. Create and install a package. So this underneath calls Wix and builds that folder for you and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then this will call MSI and do the work for you. That doesn't build anything. All it does is creates a class that references that MSI. And then at the end of the test, Wait. it'll clean it up. All right. the building was right. done earlier. Yeah. OK, fine. Yep, you're right. Just a package installer. Verify. Oh, and then there's user verifier already. Oh, that's nice. To do a bunch of validation. Yep. Anyway, so this now is just code. Can repair users. Test demonstrates failure. Hmm. Anyway, yep, there we go. So that's the way the infrastructure tests work. Any yeah, other? By the way, if you try questions? to run them in VS, they'll block it if you don't have that environment variable and you're not elevated. Thank God. So you, <laughs> yes. if you set it up correctly, you can run the tests in Visual Studio. Yeah. But now I'm really curious because this seems like it, it would not take a lot to. Oh, Rob, you said you had problems with Sandbox, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, Burn had problems with Sandbox. I've been using Sandbox to test some bundle stuff. Oh, well, that's good. So yeah. maybe it was just me. I don't. I I did not look at it. It was not the. It was not priority when I hit the problem, and I on. I haven't gone back to look at it at all. Right. I'm just because it it's not. It wouldn't take much. I think you're right. This could very well be a you know simple batch file and a WSB file to. Yeah, Sandbox would be perfect for this if it yeah. worked. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just. I mean, you're not going to get version coverage, but. That's, cool. We don't yeah. get that today anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're testing, Sandbox could be a really. It's a lightweight VM. <laughs> it's like, yeah, there it's you go. a lightweight VM. And lightweight, it's fast. Yeah. And really, really convenient. Thank you for showing it to me because <laughs> it's worth losing uh, VirtualBox. Ah, uh, right. Yeah, you had to switch to VirtualBox because it required hypervisor, right? Right. Um, right. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, and the interesting thing is we, you could create a W, I don't have time to do this. If someone wanted to do something fun and just kind of mess with it, um, if nobody else does it, maybe I'll do this on my stream, like in 
four or five, six weeks. Um, so there's plenty of time for someone else to do it. But you probably could get to a place where these things, you know, copy this directory, you probably could point a WSD to that folder. A, yeah. a, is it, a, yeah, a Windows sandbox WSD. definition. A Windbox sandbox definition say, mount this directory uh, and run this test command. And it yep. could like boot and run all the tests in one Windows sandbox and be done. Um, and you have to install the .NET SDK, but otherwise... I think it will be in the sandbox already, if you have it installed. No. no. Oh, okay. No. You don't have... Okay. There's no... Nothing that you have installed is running inside sandbox. All right. So, all right. So there, it's... Yeah. All A those... A little bit of setup. A little bit the, of setup. All those steps, then you could just like double-click in it, and then the Windows sandbox to start up, run this batch file, have to install .NET Core SDK, and then run that set of tests. It could be interesting. It's uh, yep. it's it's definitely an interesting thing to do if someone wanted to do it. It's tempting because it we're not that far off. Yeah, we're not that far off. No, it's, uh, assuming it works a sandbox. I, I wonder what happens to users you create in sandbox. Like I, it's just, I don't know. Whatever. I, yeah, I'm the, curious, are, but not enough I mean, to do the work right now. Sandbox, sandbox is limited. There, there are definitely things that would be really difficult to test right. inside Sandbox. Right. But the um, step from Sandbox to a normal VM is not that far. You're like on your way to, right, right. cool, now just make it work in a VM. It's just the Sandbox is, is nice and double clickable. So it it's, it's a really addicting little experience there. It is. It is. All right. Ron says he thinks we nailed it. So hopefully that means... We got it right, or that we at least have answered all the questions. Um, let's see. So, like I said, June 9th is the next meeting. We will do triage again. There are things like that. Um, oh, I, I mentioned offhand, but there's a new V3 build with the uh, Visual Studio 2022 uh, detection stuff in it. Um, I did get that up. So that's up in the dev builds. Um, that's all I can think of right now. Yeah, that's all I have right now. All right. All right. So two weeks, we'll be back, 9.30, same time, same place. We'll do this triage thing. Uh, we'll talk about anything else that you guys want to talk about like this. And uh, then we will um, uh, adjourn then. But for now, we're adjourning now. God, that was confusing. There was almost, <laughs> I almost saw my way out of that. That, that took some turns. Oh, man, I thought I had it. All right. Uh, I thought I nailed it. On that note, I'll be here next week doing my stream on Wednesday. You guys are welcome to join me then. We'll be back in two weeks to see if there's more stuff to talk about in the Wix toolset project and triage and such like that. Until then, you guys take it easy. Bye. Bye. Bye.